Welcome to Bethel World Outreach Church, the city of power located in Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us for our online service. Be blessed by today's message from Bishop S. Musa Corfit. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, at this moment, I decrease, oh God, like you increase in me. Yes, Lord. We bless you for this time that we can commune with you. And we glorify your holy name. Amen. 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 We worship you. Oh, Lord. Lord. The glory. We bless your name, oh Lord. Lord, you are worthy, Lord. Holy, holy is your name. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Yeah. Sing holy, holy. Holy, holy. God Almighty. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to worship. Say maker. Maker of all universe, it's an honor. It's an honor just to stand before. Sing holy, 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 holy God Almighty. It's a privilege. It's a privilege to worship.
He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. And every chain will break. As broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God, our God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah. He's growing with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God, our God is the Lamb. The Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Broken hearts declare His praise. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Our God, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, oh. To set the captives free. Oh, who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, our God, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? He's roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before Him. Our God, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain.
For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. One more time, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. And fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before you, and every knee will bow before him. Oh, every knee will bow before you. Yes, Lord, we bring you our worship. We bring you our worship, our very best. We raise our hallelujah to you because you're so worthy. You're worthy of every song we could bring and every breath we could breathe. It's all for you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the cross, oh God, for the blood of Jesus shed for us on Calvary. We thank you for the veil that was torn. We thank you for direct access to the throne of glory. We thank you for our sins that are forgiven. We thank you that we are new creatures in you. That the new is past and we're now sons and daughters in you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is, the 
What a powerful name is the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. You turn it for good. Hey, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. Every time, every time, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. What the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. We declare you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. Oh, you walk and get out for good. You take what the enemy. Turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. 
a victory. We're going to see a victory. For this battle belongs to you, Lord. We're going to see a victory. We're going to see a victory. to Bethel World Outreach Church Houston City of Power we are thankful for this wonderful resurrection money what a privilege what an honor hallelujah hallelujah that we can celebrate Jesus resurrection once again this morning we uh, want to thank all of you who are listening to this broadcast by YouTube and by Facebook live. We uh, like to invite our friends and our neighbors, um, the body of Christ within the Houston area, to tune in and to and to be blessed. We believe God has given us a word for His church, His people. Hallelujah! We thank God for um, the family of this. Um, house, the families in this house, and the families that are watching in their living rooms um, all over the city of Houston, and wherever you are, um, we are thankful to God for you. This morning, we will be ministering God's word from John chapter 20, St. John chapter 20, verse 1 to 23. Then we'll read from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. And before we do so, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We honor you. We adore you. We magnify you. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful praise and worship ministration this morning. Thank you, Lord, for anointing our ministers and the songs that they've ministered. Thank you, Father, for the victory that we have in Jesus. Thank you, O oh God, that you have given us victory through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin reading um, from St. John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter 
and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple out ran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stood, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, A woman, who are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, who are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabuna, which is to say, teacher. Je Jesus said to her, Do not cleanse to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be still. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Let's turn quickly to, um, um, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1. And here the Apostle Paul is again um, speaking. And he writes to the church in Corinth in defense of the resurrection. And here he begins by rehearsing the gospel he preached to the Corinthian church. And this is how he begins his statement. Brethren, moreover brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you have, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. I, I want to use uh, the text we just read uh, to minister this morning on this 
Resurrection Money, a message that I have titled The Empty Tomb. The empty tomb. You see, the empty tomb, or what we refer to as the resurrection of Jesus, is one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 4, verse 25, uh, Jesus, um, it says, Jesus was delivered up because of our sins or our offenses. And he was raised because of our justification. So you see that uh, Jesus' resurrection um, justifies the believer. We have been justified uh, from our sins and our offenses because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it is in the heart, it is the resurrection is the heart of the Christian faith. And without the resurrection, our faith in Jesus Christ is powerless. Our faith in Jesus Christ is hopeless our faith in Jesus Christ is unfruitful the resurrection of Jesus is so important it was important then uh, even in the Old Testament there are uh, uh, pictures of his resurrection and Jesus himself talked about his suffering his his death and his resurrection the apostle Paul in 1st Corinthians uh, chapter 15 um, the entire chapter he devoted to defending the resurrection and rather he used the resurrection of Jesus Christ to teach that there is life after death that there is resurrection after the burial hallelujah there is resurrection after death and a burial. So we see the Apostle Paul here um, defending the resurrection in First Corinthians chapter 15 because some false teachers have returned or have come to the church in Corinth and uh, they began to teach that there was no resurrection of the dead. So Paul in defending uh, this very important uh, subject of this very important uh, doctrine of the Christian faith uh, this very important uh, uh, part of Jesus life he didn't just suffer died and was buried but he rose from the dead and to deny that there is no life after death, which is the resurrection, is to deny the power of Christianity, the power of following Jesus, the power of our faith. It, it, it destroys the very fabric um, of the Christian faith, the very center of the Christian faith, the power of the Christian faith. So Paul takes his time, and I want to take a few moments as a, uh, 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 as a minister on the empty tomb to share with you uh, some scriptures that prove uh, that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I know that the entire world believes that Jesus rose from the dead. The, uh, the entire world believes in the resurrection. Even though there is no commitment, there may not be commitment to Jesus. But the entire world this weekend, in nations around the world, uh, they are commemorating his resurrection. Hallelujah. That's why we celebrate Easter. And Easter is about God sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Suffer and die on the cross and be buried. And then been raised or raised from the dead resurrected from the dead the tomb is empty hallelujah and this morning I want to let you know that the tomb 
where Jesus was buried, the tomb of Joseph, Arimathea, is empty. Hallelujah. Death has no power over you, child of God. Death has no power over the believer because of the resurrection. Now, notice in verse, verses 1 through verse uh, and 4, the Apostle Paul, in his opening verses, the opening statement of, of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he takes his time to rehearse the gospel he preached to the Corinthians. To the believers in Corinth, he says that he preached the gospel which he received. And he tells them that first, when he preached, they received the gospel and they believed the gospel. And it is in this gospel which he preached to them that they were now standing. And he says, unless they believed in vain, they were saved by this gospel. Paul encourages them to continue in the gospel. And this gospel, Paul described it in verses 3 and 4. And this is the gospel Paul preached to them. And he says he received it. He didn't make it up. He received the gospel by revelation from God by the Holy Spirit. He said the gospel is this that Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture and that Jesus was buried and that Jesus rose on the rose again on the third day Jesus rose again on the third day Paul says this is the gospel he received. And this gospel that Paul preached to the Corinthians, which he received by revelation, is the gospel of grace. It's the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There is no other gospel than the gospel of grace. And the gospel of grace includes the life, the suffering, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Minus the resurrection, the gospel is incomplete. Minus the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Minus the empty tomb, the gospel is powerless. The gospel and our faith is fruitless, hopeless. Hallelujah. The gospel gives us hope, hope to live in this life and the life to come. The gospel gives us hope to live the life of power, the life of victory. The gospel gives us power. Faith in the gospel gives us power. That's what Paul says. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. And the power of God is seen in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so it is not only that the Paul preached the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but Christ himself spoke, predicted his suffering, his death, his rest, and his resurrection. When he preached the kingdom, I want to show you a few verses 
quickly to prove to you that the tomb was empty when, the, when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and Peter and John who went at the tomb the tomb was empty hallelujah let's go to Luke chapter 24 and verse 26 uh, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus they went into the tomb the tomb was empty it was the first time the tomb was used because uh, Joseph of uh, Arimathea bought the tomb. It was never used. It was virgin. It was a virgin tomb. And only Jesus was uh, buried in the tomb that some who believe uh, that because he was rich and affluent, he had bought the tomb for himself, preparing for his death. But when Jesus died, he went to Pilate and requested the body of Jesus. And it is in that tomb that he buried Jesus. And when they went to see his body in the tomb, his body was not found. The tomb was empty. He had risen from the dead. Look at verse 46. Luke 24, 46. Luke 24 and verse 46. Uh, then he said to them thus it is written and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day Jesus here is speaking that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise the third day why was it necessary for our justification for our victory hallelujah as chapter 30 verse 18 as chapter 30 verse 18 hallelujah these scriptures point to the fact that the tomb is empty but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ will suffer he has thus fulfilled. So here, Luke writes that Christ's resurrection was foretold by the prophets that he will suffer, he will die, and be buried. But he will rise from the dead. Here, it is fulfilled. And so, uh, Luke quotes from the prophets in Acts chapter 17. Paul is turning, he's preaching, okay, at Mass Hill, and he declares Christ's suffering. Paul explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer. So, in his preaching, the apostle Paul. At Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, it's explaining, expanding the scripture. And he demonstrated that the Christ, the Christ had to suffer, rise and rise again from the dead. And say, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. No other Jesus, but the one that appeared to him on his way to Damascus. The one that demonstrated the power of the resurrection. Now you need to understand that when Jesus appeared to the apostle Paul on his way to Damascus, it was the resurrected Christ that appeared to him. He gave him a vision. Paul didn't believe in Jesus when Jesus was on the face of the earth preaching. He believed Christ after Christ resurrected and appeared to him. So, no wonder the Apostle Paul received the grace message that includes the suffering, the death, the burial, 
and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ was preached by Paul. And every time he preached the gospel, he preached the resurrection. Because the resurrection makes the gospel complete. The resurrection empowers the life of the believer. Hallelujah. In Acts 26, Paul is standing before Festus and he is defending himself. He is defending his life. So this is what he says, that the Christ who suffer, that he will be the first to rise from the dead and will, pro and will proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Paul is defending his, his, his faith before Festus. Look at verse 24. Now as he does made his defense, Festus said, to Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad or crazy. The man is defending his faith, his reason for believing and preaching the gospel before Festus. He's defending his very life. And in his defense of his faith and his life. Guess what? He preaches the gospel. And in preaching the gospel, he mentions the suffering, the death of Jesus. But also, he mentions with power and conviction that Jesus rose from the dead. And as he defended himself, Festus stopped him. And he says to him, with a loud voice, you are out of your mind. Much learning is driving you crazy. Hear me. It is the power of the risen Christ that was present when Paul stood before Festus to preach. And he was convicted. But because of being politically right, others were listening. He stopped Paul instead of believing in Jesus and giving his life to Jesus so that he will experience the resurrection power so that he will receive the Holy Ghost Paul says later on in the book of Romans he says if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you he shall quicken your mortal body hear me hear me if Festus had opened his heart to receive Jesus as Paul preached about the resurrection he would have received the resurrection power and his life would have been transformed so the scriptures we gave you and there are many more scriptures all confirmed the importance and the reality of uh, Jesus' resurrection hallelujah so the empty tomb and his physical appearances demonstrate the power and the sovereignty of God over death, over impossibilities, over hardship, over difficulties. Hear me as we celebrate uh, this resurrection uh, this Sunday. Hallelujah. I want to say to you, uh, those of you who are going through difficulties and challenges, those of you who are on your sick bed, if you are listening to me this morning, hallelujah, I say to you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees that you shall not die back the coronavirus. You shall not die because of the sickness that is in your body. You shall not die because of the sufferings of the things you're going through. You shall live because of the resurrection power. I come to declare to you life because Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. He's alive. Hallelujah. The empty tomb and the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection in the gospel as recorded by the, by the writers of the epistles 
And especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 by the Apostle Paul, have inspired and sustained the faith of believers throughout the centuries. The empty tomb and the appearance of Jesus which we read in scripture, which we've preached over the years, have inspired me, have inspired many believers that Jesus Christ is alive and my faith is what it is because of the resurrection. A few years ago, I believe five years ago, I was privileged. Now, we and I were privileged to travel to Israel and we saw many, many uh, uh, biblical locations or scenes in Israel. One of the things that we wanted to see and experience so badly is to visit the tomb of Joseph where Jesus was buried and brothers and sisters uh, whenever you have the opportunity to go to Israel make sure you visit the tomb my wife and I went in and uh, there are people waiting outside usually it's, it's, it's parked and people go in and while they're coming out others are going in but we took more than 20 minutes just being just sat in there and 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 uh, and take it in. It was so real because the tomb is empty. The tomb where Jesus was buried is empty. I saw other places that the Bible mentions in Jerusalem or in Israel, but for the tomb, the presence of God. Uh, faith was inspired faith was elevated because not only what I read in the Bible but now I was experiencing what I've been reading and preaching over the years and that brings me to our text I want to bring out two things from the text we read this morning from John chapter 20 the scripture says in John 20 now the first day of the week Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early and while it was still dark and she saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb the Bible says then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple notice it said the other disciple okay so and I believe that the other disciple that she's talking about here is John the Beloved. So she comes to them and tells them that they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So we see that on Easter morning, that first Easter morning, uh, uh, Jesus had been crucified. He had been buried. And throughout his life ministry, he talked about his suffering, his barrier, his resurrection. And so they, they went to the tomb. Only they found out that the tomb was open. They ran back to the disciples. And Peter and John, the scripture says, watch this. He says, now Peter and John ran to the tomb. But it says that John out ran Peter. He came and passed by Peter but with speed. And as he came to the open tomb, he stooped at the entrance of the tomb but never entered. He stooped, looked in, and saw the grave, the grave cloth that was used to wrap Jesus, Jesus' body for burial. The scripture says, 
Peter came and entered in. So Peter entered while John who outran him stooped, stooped at the door. Peter entered and he saw the linen cloth lying there. He also saw the, uh, the, the, the handkerchief or the scarf that was used to wrap Jesus' his head. And they were lying in separate positions on the grave, the spot where he was laid. The Bible said then, the other disciple, John, who came to the tomb first, went in. Hallelujah. Now, and this is where I believe God wants me to bring out the first thought. I want to leave with you. That John believed the restoration of Jesus after he entered in and saw the empty tomb. He saw the linen cloth and the scarf that were used to wrap the body of Jesus in his face. But the body of Jesus was not present in the tomb. Jesus had risen from the dead. So John and Peter encountered the empty tomb. But it says that John, when he saw the empty tomb, he believed. What did he believe? He believed that Jesus was alive again. Hallelujah. Remember that when Jesus was arrested, uh, the disciples were scattered. In fact, Jesus prophesied to them that that night that they would be offended because the shepherd, the shepherd will be smitten. But hear me, John, even though he heard Jesus preach over and over again about his suffering, his burial, and his resurrection, but they did not have a revelation of the resurrection. Hallelujah. He did not have the revelation of the resurrection. Not at the, the disciples. Hallelujah. But once he entered and saw the empty tomb, he believed. He believed because he received a revelation of the resurrection of Jesus by the empty tomb. In fact, when you look at verse 9, look at verse 9 of St. John chapter 20, go to verse 9. It says, For as yet they did not know the scripture. What that means is they did not have a revelatory truth of the scripture, a revelation, revelatory knowledge of the scripture. They heard him preach, they read from the Old Testament. But now, what happened when he saw the empty tomb, he believed. Hallelujah. His eyes were opened, his perception was changed his understanding about who Jesus was was transformed he had come into a personal experience with the risen Christ by the empty tomb by the revelation of the empty tomb there is something about having a personal experience that produces faith this encounter this experience of the empty tomb inspired the faith of John and our belief of Peter oh they have been with Jesus for over three years yet they didn't believe in the resurrection because they had no experience hallelujah no revelation you see, you can be in the church, you can be in the congregation, and yet have no experience. God will want you to have a personal experience with him. Hallelujah. You cannot base your faith, hallelujah, on the belief of others. It has to be a personal experience. And here we see Jesus Christ, God 
Almighty, the Holy Ghost working together to prepare these apostles, these disciples to preach this gospel of the kingdom, his suffering, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The gospel of grace is the gospel that declares that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried and that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. This is the gospel. This is the power of God. The resurrection. God wants to give you a personal experience. Many of us depend on corporate experience. Here we see Jesus Christ allowing John to come into faith. You see, the experience of the empty tomb changed the perception of the disciples, changed the perception of Mary Magdalene. Hallelujah. In a, in a new way, in a way that they've never known Jesus. Now, John believed that Jesus was real and was risen from the dead. It is, it, it is the personal experience and the revealed knowledge that produced and sustains faith in Christ. You will need a personal experience on this resurrection morning. And my prayer for you this morning, as you listen to this word, as you receive the word and believe the word, may God open your eyes. May God give you a personal experience of the resurrection. That the tomb is empty. You see, when John saw the empty tomb, he believed. His life changed. In fact, all the believers who saw Jesus after his resurrection, their perception changed, their lives changed, their faith moved to a whole new level. That they did not waste their lives following Jesus. That they did not waste their lives by living what they did for living to follow Christ. That many who believe, who will teach, or who will make uh, committed believers to feel that it's a waste of time to serve Jesus. Hear me, it is not a waste of time. If Jesus had not risen, then you can say and teach that it is a waste of time. But because Jesus is alive, hallelujah, he will not allow your life to be wasted. The power of the risen Christ is at work in you as a believer. Oh, praise God. You see, my prayer for you is that you will receive a revelatory knowledge and, a, and have a revelatory experience of the resurrection power of God and the risen Savior. You see, God used the empty tomb, but also uh, the many appearances of Jesus Christ after his resurrection to solidify, elevate and solidify uh, the faith of the apostles. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive this resurrection morning. He's alive. He's not dead. And you ask me, how do you know, preacher, that he's alive? I know that he's alive because he lives in me. Hallelujah. I was once a sinner, once blind. Hallelujah. Dead in my sins and my trespasses. My life was headed to the grave. I was headed beyond was headed to destruction but Jesus came in when I believe and by his grace he saved me because I believe his gospel, this gospel of grace by faith you see all the four gospel writers mentioned the empty tomb we just read John's um, account uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6 Matthew 28 and verse 6. 
Let me show you again uh, that the tomb is empty. So the angel said, he is not here for he is risen as he said. That's why Jesus said he will rise again. And then the angel said, come see the place where they lay him. Or where they lay, where the Lord lay. The tomb is empty. Let's go to Mark 16 verse 6. Mark chapter 16 verse 6. Again the angel said, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. Notice, there is no other Jesus. There are some who are skeptics who teach that it wasn't Jesus who went around doing miracles who died. Some say, well, Thomas. <laughs> they say he was stolen, taken away from the cross. He read that he died. Hear me. He says, you seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He was crucified. He died. That you and I will receive life and live internally forever and ever. He said he is risen. He is not here. Where? In this tomb. The tomb is empty. See the place where they laid him. Again, he confirms. Mark confirms that the tomb was and is empty. Let's look at Luke. Luke 24 verse 3. Luke 24 verse 3. Luke 24 verse 3. Hallelujah. In Luke 24 verse 3, the Bible said that they went in, then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They went into the tomb and they did not found. They did not see. I went into the tomb five years ago and I did not see the body of my Lord. He's risen. He's alive. The second thing I want to bring out of our text is this. That the revelation and the proof of the resurrection is a necessity to your faith. You need to believe that Jesus rose again. And that's why the Apostle Paul took his time to teach on Christ's resurrection because it is a necessity to your faith. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, which we use again in, in verse 12 and verse 13, um, uh, uh, Paul says, Now if Christ is preached, that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, we've been preaching and you have believed in a life, suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've been preaching that. And you have believed. Now if others have come by us. They'll tell you. That there is no resurrection of the dead. What they are saying is. Christ did not resurrect. And in fact. If you were to die. There is no life after death. So what they're teaching is. They're teaching a gospel. That is. Powerless. They were teaching a gospel that is without future, without hope. So Paul in verse 13 said, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raising. So what Paul is teaching here is that there is the resurrection of the dead. That when you die and when I die, in Christ, we shall be raising. From the dead. Hallelujah. We shall rise again. Oh, death is not the final end of the believer. Hallelujah. When you receive Jesus, you receive 
eternal life that means your spirit lives on forever with God in his heaven Jesus said I've gone to prepare a place for you and he is preparing a place for the church for the believer he's coming back again why because there is resurrection after death so Paul says if they're teaching that there is no resurrection of the dead and we have been preaching to you that Christ rose from the dead uh, then there is no resurrection of the dead and if there is no resurrection of, of the dead then Christ is not risen but we see brothers and sisters that Christ rose from the dead Christ is alive that's why we celebrate Easter oh I want to tell you it doesn't matter what you're going through what suffering you're going through God is your answer God is your hope the resurrection is your hope you shall rise again from that situation God will bring you out if you believe in the power of the the resurrection if you believe in the living Christ you shall rise again so uh, the revelation and the proofs the revelation of the empty tomb and the proof of his appearances or the proof of the resurrection by his appearances elevates your faith sustains your faith it gives you as a believer hope for the future hallelujah every time Jesus revealed himself to, to his disciples he was giving a solid proof to the believer that the tomb was empty and that he was alive you see we need a revelation of the living Christ Mary Magdalene experienced Jesus in his resurrected body. When she saw Jesus, even though she was weeping for her Lord, but when she saw him and he spoke to her, she believed to the extent that she wanted to cling to him, but he said, don't touch me because I'm not yet glorified. Jesus revealed himself to these women who went back to uh, the tomb to, uh, to, to anoint him with the spices when they experienced the living Christ that the tomb was empty they went back to the disciples to tell them that the Lord was risen oh, that first Easter morning the women were the ones who preached the empty tomb and this morning I'm only uh, only adding my voice uh, to what has been written in scripture to what my, my, my our fathers of the faith have preached over the years that the tomb is empty the, the tomb where Jesus was buried is empty and Jesus is alive hallelujah I don't care where they place you I don't care where you are what conditions you are in you are coming out of there because of the power of the risen Christ I don't care what trouble you are in I don't care what circumstances you find yourself in you are coming out because of the resurrection of Jesus because of the resurrection power of Jesus you're coming out you're coming out so Jesus revealed himself to Peter to John and to the twelve. In the same text we read, he revealed himself to the 12 disciples. But I want to, I want to close with um, uh, Jesus' appearance to the two who travel a seven miles journey to Emmaus. I'm going to use that uh, to tie in my message this morning. Jesus appeared to the two on the, uh, on the road to Emmaus. Luke chapter 24, verse 13, please. Luke 24, 13 to 27. Um, I wonder, it's, it's, it's a little bit long reading, but it is necessary because I want to use this to, uh, to tie my message this morning. Luke 
Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 27. Now behold, two of them, notice it says two of them. Uh, these two were not known, they, they were not famous, but they were believers. So two of them were traveling that same day, the same day that Jesus rose from the dead. They were traveling to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of the things, of these things which had happened in the city of Jerusalem. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. <laughs> and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you are having with one another as you walk in a sad? So notice that the disciples, the morning that uh, uh, Peter and John and uh, had come back and, and said that what the women said was true, that Jesus was raising, the, uh, uh, they were perplexed that he was gone from the grave because it seems to me that many of them were concerned where Jesus was at the moment. And so they sad. And when you read the text further, you see why they were sad. Verse 18. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have... Verse 19. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and what before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping, watch this, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. So they are looking for political redemption, looking for economic redemption, looking for physical freedom. Yet, in their little minds, they've lost all hope because Jesus was arrested, crucified, buried. And now they're receiving news, or they just received news that he resurrected, he's risen. And he wasn't around. And so they are discouraged. They are sad going to Emmaus. And then he said, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angel who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb that Peter and John and other disciples and found it just as the women said, confirmation that the tomb was empty. But him they did not see. Hear me? Even though these two men were not of the cream of the crop, the twelve. They were not known. Their resume is not mentioned. But notice that Jesus, the unseen guest, he sees their frustration. He, he sees their sadness. He feels their pain, their agony, ah, their hopelessness. I don't know what you're going through this morning, this Easter morning. In this season that we found ourselves, not just in this nation, but around the world. Uh, people are so confused. Uh, people are giving up hope, including believers. People don't know what to do, what to say about this coronavirus. Uh, family members are dying and, 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 and friends are dying. People have, have been infested by the virus and life is bleak. Life seems to be hopeless. But I come to tell you that God wants to give you a personal experience of the resurrection of Jesus. Here these two men, sad, hopeless, 
their faith seems to be not working and they are going away from Jerusalem where all of this thing has taken place where Jesus was arrested where Jesus was beaten where Jesus was crucified was buried and they are walking away from Jerusalem going into Emmaus they are walking seven miles away from Jerusalem and Jesus sees their frustration Jesus sees their agony Jesus sees their hopelessness their faith has given up you see the resurrection ain't just for Jesus it's for you who believe if you're a believer in Jesus it means you believe in his birth his suffering, his, his, his crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if you believe in the resurrection, I come to tell you that there is no condition, no situation, no sickness, including the coronavirus. You are an overcomer because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. They are walking away, walking away from Jerusalem. There are people who are walked away from the church, walked away from God, walked away from Jesus because what they expected from Jesus, they did not receive. What they are expecting now, and or yesterday, or last year, last month, they didn't receive, so they walked away. I am telling you that God wants to give you a personal experience. You need to come back to Him. In this season, God is preparing His church, preparing the believers for the return of Jesus. You need to come back because He wants to give you a personal experience. So they walk into Emmaus and He behaved. In fact, he asked them, what are you talking? And they, be, and they began to say to him, are you a stranger? Are you a sojourner here? Uh, haven't you heard what's happening or what happened in recent times in Jerusalem? And he said, why it is? He said, Jesus, of Nazareth, a man or a prophet, mighty indeed before God and before the people. He was arrested, crucified, and buried. And today is the third day since that happened. And a few of the women among us went to the grave and, and they came back saying that the grave was empty. And then a few of our men and a few of the, 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 the disciples went in and came back and confirmed that he's alive. The scripture says, that as they journeyed to Emmaus, he behaved as though he was going to another direction. And then they implored him to come and spend the evening with them. Notice that Jesus caused their eyes to be restrained so that he can hear what they were thinking. So that he can converse with them and have an opportunity to Expound the scripture from Moses to, to the present. And the Bible said they entered the home and as he began to break bread, we didn't have time to read out of that. They noticed in the breaking of bread, their eyes open and then he vanished. You see, they are open by the revelation of the breaking of the bread. They realized by experience that he was the Christ, the living Christ. And the scripture says that that very night, <laughs> they went back to Jerusalem to confirm and to affirm to the rest of the disciples that Jesus appeared to them on their way to Emmaus. They arose the very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying the Lord is risen indeed so Jesus appeared to John Jesus appeared to, to Mary Magdalene excuse me but he had not appeared to them the next people or next two he appeared to with these two Cleopas and the other brother now they go back to Jerusalem to tell them indeed it is true the tomb is empty 
It is true. Jesus is alive. It is true. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. And this was the message of the first century church that Jesus is alive. And that's why Paul was here. Because he preached Christ being alive. And the religious folk didn't like that. So they told the twelve that he's alive. They encouraged the twelve that Christ was alive. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. He gave them a revelation of the breaking of bread. All of a sudden, as he broke the bread, they received a revelation. The experience, you see, ladies and gentlemen, they have been confused and perplexed about his death, his burial, his resurrection. They were disappointed because they were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. But the resurrection or his appearance to them but the resurrection gave them hope, raised or elevated their faith. Hallelujah. May God give you a revelation of the living Christ. May God give you a revelation of the resurrection power so that your faith be elevated, so that your faith begin to produce the power of God in your daily walk. And as you deal with the situations of life. You see the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just for Jesus but it's for you. So that you walk in the power of the spirit. So that you have hope not just in the life to come but hope in this life to overcome the things that are pressing on you. The things that are stressing you. The things that are, that are, that are overcome or seem to be overcoming you. The things that are frustrating you. The problems of life that come to challenge your faith. It is the restoration power that gives you victory over those things. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, the spirit if the spirit of God that raised Jesus, the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead if he dwells in you he shall quicken your mortal body. He shall give life. Receive life this morning. Receive health. Receive victory. Receive healing. Receive power because of the resurrection. If you are a believer, you have been quickened. You've been made alive. If you're a believer, because of the resurrection, you have hope. Hope in this life to overcome in this life and to live forever in eternity. If you're a believer, you have power. The quickening power, the resurrection power that indwells you through the living Christ. You can overcome that sickness. You can overcome the virus. You can overcome even in the cell what you've been placed for whatever it is that you have committed you an overcomer if you believe and wherever you are this Sunday morning I release resurrection power I release peace shalom if this broadcast has blessed you if this message has blessed you and you want to know more about Jesus I challenge you to not only hear this word, receive this word, believe it, and act upon it now. If you want to receive Jesus Christ and experience the resurrection power, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Make it your personal prayer. I'm just leading you. And I want you to believe. Say, dear God, I thank you for your word. I believe your word. I believe Jesus died for me on the cross. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose again on the third day for my justification. According to your word, in Romans 10, 8 and 9, if I believe 
and confess him as my Lord, I am saved. If you believe and you said this prayer after me, you are saved. Based on the power and the integrity of God's word, I declare you saved. I encourage you to tune in next Sunday for another preaching and teaching on the resurrection. You see, there are many churches and many of us preach series on different topics and different subjects. And I believe God is encouraging my heart as a result of the revelation that I received this weekend as I study to do a series on the resurrection. Let me pray for you if you are sick. And those of you sick in the hospital, those of you on the attack of uh, the devil, in Jesus' name, I release the grace of God. I release the power of the resurrection. I release the spirit of the resurrection into your bodies, into your circumstances, into your situations. And I declare you healed. I declare you healed. Receive healing now. Receive victory now in the name of Jesus. Overcome now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen. Hello viewers, it's good to be with you again on this Sunday morning. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to our social media platforms to view us today. I hope you had a wonderful time hearing from our bishop the word of God preached to you. I'm here to encourage us on giving and before I do that I want to extend a word of thank you to every one of you who have been given generously to the ministry on behalf of our bishop, Lady Pharma Coffee, and the entire leadership of Better Well Outreach Ministries, City of Power, for your generosity in helping us take the gospel to the nations of the world. I want to read with you briefly from the book of Philippians chapter 1. This is supposed to Paul writing to the church in Philippi who was in partnership with him for the preaching of the gospel to the nations of the world. We all know that no church supported Paul has this wonderful church, and there is a lot we can learn from them. Paul writes into them, Philippians 1, 4, and 5. He says, In every prayer of mine, I always make my entreaty and petition for you all with joy. I thank my God for your fellowship, your sympathetic cooperation and contributions and partnership in advancing the good news, the gospel, from the first day you heard of it until now. This was a church that was in strategic partnership with Paul's missions of planting churches all around Asia Minor. You and I know that most of the churches that were planted in, in present-day Europe were planted by Paul. He went to the different nations of the world preaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We get those accounts from the book of Acts. Acts record the first missionary journey of Paul, the second and the third planting churches all around those different territories. He was able to plant churches like the church in Corinth, Ephesus, uh, uh, Galatia, and the different uh, major cities in, in Athens because he had strategic believers who were partnershiping with him through giving so he could take the gospel to the nations of the world. We all know that Better Houston support missionaries all around the world. We support churches in Brazil. We support churches in Australia. We support churches in, in, in Asia. We support churches in Europe. Thanks to your generosity. Thank you for giving sacrificially even during these troubling times. We all know that we are all in, in, in very challenging, turbulent moment. Not only uh, our health under threat, we also have uh, economic turbulence all around the world. Many people being laid off their work. But we know that Jesus continues to be the hope of the world. And the church stands out as the light of the world, as the salt of the earth, to preserve the earth. We have to keep preaching Jesus as the solution. And for us to do that, we have to make sure we pay our utility bills. We pay our mortgage. We get new equipment so we can keep preaching the gospel to you as we are doing today. And every week, we have our Jerusalem ministry at least twice every month. They feed about 400 families in partnership with with the Houston Food Bank, thanks to your generosity. These are things you are making happen. In your own way, through your giving, you are helping us reach out to needy families. Every week, we have desperate 
people, calls coming from desperate people in need of food, asking when we are doing distribution and we keep directing them to come and get food from the church. And we are able to do all those things thanks to your generosity. And yet Paul is uh, uh, commending the church in Philippi and telling them that I thank God for your partnership with me in preaching the gospel, in preaching the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what exactly you are doing with your tithes and offerings to this church and even in supporting missions. God bless you, viewers, and thank you for giving to our church life. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you praise for everyone that keeps giving and sowing into this ministry. Your word says, he that soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. And we release your blessings upon everyone that releases their tithes and releases their offerings through our different giving platform so we can keep preaching the gospel to the nations of the world. We give you praise, Father, for your grace to give and for sustaining them during these challenging moments. We declare supernatural provisions in their lives. We declare financial favor. We declare supernatural sustenance even in these challenging moments in Jesus' name. Giving has been made very easy for you and I. You can give through cash app, dollar sign, better COP, all in cap. And you'll be able to channel your tithes, your offering to Better Walla Rich Ministries, a city of power. And you can also give through our website, www.bettercityofpower.com. And you can give through text to give. So there are different platforms for you to give. After my message, follow the, the, the announcement that will be given and give your tithes and offering. God bless you. Thank you for watching our online service. If you have been blessed by this message, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow Bethel Houston on Facebook for upcoming events. If you would like to give, you can text 833-501-3566 following the directions on screen. You can also use the Cash App to give following the directions on screen. Thank you for watching. Have a blessed day.